started with my recorder here. Hmm? My mic should be on. Thank you for checking. So, yep, mic is working. And this mic is uh, annoyingly, you know, sensitive. You know, when people come in through the door, you know, when they slam the door, you will hear, you know, that really, really clearly on uh, in YouTube. All right. So this is what you should be seeing, you know, after you sign in. Even if you're not enrolled in the class, you know, you will still see this part. And the first thing we want to do is to go through the syllabus. Which is a little bit boring, but it is something that I have to do, you know, because it is, you know, college and district policy. Yeah, right. Can't skip it. Cannot skip it. it. <laughs> All right, so this is uh, programming for mobile devices one, which means there's a two, you know, there's uh, CISP 363, which is the second part of this class. Um, that class is quite a bit different in terms of what programming language we are going to use, um, but we will still be dealing with Android devices instead of iOS devices. So if your objective is to learn how to program iOS devices, you probably won't get any specific information, but I'm s assuming that between Android and iOS, there should still be some common ground and you know, some of the techniques will still be useful for iOS devices. The description is just you know, copied and pasted from the college catalog, so there should be nothing new. Uh, this course introduces mobile device programming, including devices such as devices such as cell phones and tablets. Topics include development tools, user interface design, documentation, testing, debugging, and publishing. Um, and student learning objectives is basically a list of things that you should be able to do after completing this class with a letter grade of C or better. Uh, this class is a three-unit class. We have 54 lecture hours and 54 lab hours. According to the schedule, it is 54 lab hours that are face-to-face -face, and then the lecture hours are online. I'm going to flip it, okay? So I'm going to put all the lecture hours face-to-face -face and then the quote-unquote lab hours, you know, online. So that means, you know, you will have to find ways to do the homework assignments, you know, other than in this classroom. Okay, if you want to do it here, that's fine with me, but the primary objective is the lecture, you know, when we are face to face. Okay. Are there any questions about, you know, the format of the class or how I'm going to allocate the time? Questions? Moving on. <clears throat> this is my information about myself. You know, I'm Tak. Last name is Aoyoung, you know, but it's really kind of difficult to pronounce. You just, you can just call me Tak. Um, my office is number seven in Liberal Arts 133, which is one aisle on the other side. Um, office hours are really easy for this semester. It's just, you know, eight to nine o'clock right before this class. Uh, but it's also on Tuesdays and Thursdays. So if you want to contact me on any day during the week other than Friday, uh, that would be the time to, you know, come see me. I'm probably going to be in my office starting from 7 a.m. anyway. So if you want to come earlier than 8 o'clock, you know, I might be in the office, but you can always, you know, check with that, check with me um, before you come really early that morning, just to be sure that I'll be there earlier. Uh, but most of the time, I'll be there early. Office number is 484-8250, and I use my Gmail, you know, for all, you know, students' correspondence. It's just a whole lot easier this way, so I can keep, you know, all the other school stuff, you know, on the other side. And the online classroom is moodle.lovesreels.edu. It is on the whiteboard. So nothing really too exciting here. Any questions? Very exciting. It is very exciting. <laughs> All right, section information. Meetings are uh, Monday, Wednesday only on from 8 o'clock to 10.20. Okay, since we're here already, we know it. Uh, the final exam is December 15th and it's going to be from 8 to 10 a.m. Okay, so you might want to block that time off um, on your calendar just to make sure that you can make it to the final exam. All right, so now we get to the really, really boring stuff. All policies of this class are extensions to the ones already imposed by the Los Rios district. Okay, so basically, you know, I'm just making sure that I'm conforming to all those rules. 
This class has no prerequisites. Okay, you know, it's a, one of the few programming classes that do not have um, prerequisites. Um, the other one is CISP 370 and CISP 300. Um, those classes also do not have prerequisites. So I'm going to skip this part because we do not have any prerequisites. But this class does have one prerequisite. You have to be taking or have taken CISP 300, 320, which is COBOL, or 370, which is Visual Basic. So you have to be either taking those classes in the same semester, in this semester, or have taken one of those few three classes before this semester. Okay. So are there any questions about the co-requisite of this class? This, uh, what are we doing to um, I have the quote unquote homework assignments for you guys to turn in a PDF or a screenshot. So you don't need to have a official transcript. You can just take a screenshot when you log in and you know you can either give me your current schedule if you're taking CISP 300 this semester or if you have taken it already just you know do a PDF or a screenshot of your online transcript and attach it to the you know send in the attachment as a file and you know that's good with me okay so I'll explain that later okay <clears throat> But people without any proof of prerequisite will be dropped within a week. So you have basically one week to you know get this step over, get get them with this step here. Um, we have several excuses that you know for attendance purposes. Um, if a student is sick with a doctor's note, you know dated and signed, you know that particular absent will be excused. Um, basically, all kinds of uh, duty, you know, all kinds of. Um, to call that <coughs> summons, you know, because of government-related government uh, activities will also be excused. All right, so here's the really good stuff here. Um, a student may be dropped from any class when that student's absences exceed 6% of the total hours of class time. This is a district policy. It is not even a college policy. It is a Los Rios district policy. The six percent is basically the threshold of you know being excessive. The source is here. You can just you know, click on the source and actually read it you know over there. If you need to be, if you're going to be absent, and it's one of the three reasons that I mentioned earlier, you want to you know, report it or tell me ahead of time uh, as soon as possible. Okay, I know you cannot schedule sickness. Well. If it can't be scheduled, it probably is some kind of weird sickness. <laughs> so if you're sick, you know, just try to contact me as soon as it is possible. I know sometimes you know, people are sick and they cannot even get out of the bed, but as soon as possible, you know, let me know or you know, have someone to call me, you know, and let me know that you know you're sick and you cannot make it to school. So the question is, what if it is some other reason that you cannot make it to class? What if a child is sick? What if a car is, has broken down, you know, and so on and so forth, and you get a flat tire or something along that line? Well, that's what those, that 6% is for, okay? 6% of 54 lecture hours turns out to be 3.24 hours, which is about three, of three, hours and 20, three hours and 15 minutes. This class meets uh, twice each week, and each duration is 80 minutes. So what that really boils down to is the third unexcused absent will be counted as excessive. Okay. So everyone, everyone in this class has basically an allowance of two unexcused absences. You don't have to tell me why. You, know, you can just be missing from the class, but you can only it can only occur up to twice. Okay, the third time it happens, it becomes excessive. Are there any questions about the excessive absence policy? No questions? Okay. <clears throat> Attendance for online classes, it does not apply to this class because this is a hybrid class. It is not a fully online class. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take row you know, in each class. Um, I forgot to print my row sheet today, so I'm going to have to rely on a you know, the you know, quote-unquote paper form. And I'm going to do it 
I, I'll try to do it really fast, you know, on the screen, you know, so it won't take up too much time. Okay. Are there any questions on this slide about attendance, what is excused, what is not excused, and so on? Questions? All right. Let's move on. Um, the classroom and the labs are facilities provided only for the scheduled and intended coursework. So in this classroom, at this time, um, we are supposed to be doing CISB 362 related stuff, okay? Now what if you have an English paper due in you know, two hours and you really want to frantically finish it? You know what, as long as you're not disturbing your neighbors, it's okay with me, okay? It's not a problem. Um, if you have a calculus test coming up, you know, and you need to kind of study, you know, while trying to listen to me talking about Android programming, that's okay with me as long as it is not disturbing your neighbors, okay? So the key is don't distract other people, but as long as it's not distracting other people, it is not disrespectful, and you're just kind of doing it quietly, you know, it's not a big problem. All right. So the, the really, the one big thing that I kind of really have to curb, you know, has to do with disruptive or distracting, you know, type of activities. And chatting is the most common one. Um, this class is really quiet up to this point, you know, so we, I'm not expecting a lot of problems. But with some of my other classes, you know, chatting is like really, really, you know, excessive to the point where, you know, it becomes difficult for students in the back to listen to me because somebody is chatting in between. Uh, pets, unless it is a legitimate helper, you know, dog, um, I don't, I have never known of any helper cats. Um, so you know, just don't bring any pets to school. I'm not seeing anything happening like that here, so I, I'm like not expecting any problems. Uh, cell phone is another common problem. Cell phone ringing, especially those with interesting rain tones. <clears throat> as much as I enjoy those interesting rain tones, it can be a distraction in class. So if you are expecting someone to call you or text you, that's okay, it's not a problem, okay? It's just that you want to turn your, you know, ringer all the way down, you know, turn it into vibrate mode. If you need to answer a call, walk out of the classroom, finish your conversation, and you can walk back in. Yep. Since this is an Android class, kind of the normal cell phone rules, I was wondering about how that comes into play in this class. Well, we still don't want it to ring, you know, you know, even though you can use the device for programming purposes. Um, one app that I have found that is really useful is called Tasker. Uh, Tasker is a really cool app because um, it allows you to schedule silence for your cell phone. In other words, you can turn it will it can automatically turn off the ringer of your phone uh, for you know from this time to this time on these certain days, and then after that time, it will automatically turn the ringer back on. Because one problem with me is I can turn it off, but I always forget to turn it back on. So when people try to call me, they they cannot reach me and they get upset. Um, with this app, it's not an issue. Yep. And with this app, you know, uh, using time and date is one way to turn off the ringer, but you can also use the orientation of the phone to turn off the ringer. So the way I have programmed it so far is if it is face down, it turns off, it turns off the ringer. Doesn't matter what time, what day, it just turns off the ringer. So I find it to be quite useful because sometimes it's not during this class time, like you know, during my office hour and I'm falling asleep in my office, I just you know, put my cell phone you know, face down and it won't ring. Okay, so the, the, uh, the app, by the way, is called Tasker. So if you just look up Android app, you know, Tasker, um, you will find it online. It's not free, um, it's three bucks, but I do like you know, that app a lot. Okay, and for those of you who like programming, you will probably enjoy using that app as well. Any questions about this part? Okay. All right. Getting back to here. No eating or drinking is permitted in the classroom or lab, particularly in this classroom because we do have computers on the desk. So you know, if you have anything that you need to drink or eat, you know, you can do it outside. I mean, if you just want to take a five-minute break, you know, do it outside, not a problem. Just kind of don't do it in a very distracting way. Uh, Non-compliant participants will be asked to leave the classroom or lab, and security may be involved. You know, in case someone says, you know, I don't want to go outside. I'm going to have my drumstick right here and right now. 
Okay. Okay, this part has to do with um, academic honesty. So the way I define academic dishonesty, or you know, the lack of honesty, is an act of deception in which a student claims credit for work or effort of another person or uses unauthorized material or fabrication in fabricated information in any academic work. It occurs when students attempt to show possession of a level of competency, knowledge, of skill that they do not possess. Okay, so I'm not, you know, giving you examples of activities like, you know, copying from somebody else, you know, as cheating. I'm just telling you, you know, just in a broad sense what I consider as cheating. Are there any questions about this particular item? No questions. Okay. Now, an attempt to show possession of a level of a level that is lower than the actual competency is not cheating. It's only when it's higher than it is cheating. Okay. So these cases will be report, may be reported to administration. It depends on the severity, depends on the frequency and stuff like that. Um, and accumulation of these attempts, possibly from multiple classes, can lead to expulsion from the college. And all participants involved in the dishonesty will not receive points for the work that is submitted. And this includes the people or person who originate the material. Okay, so what that's really telling you is somebody, if somebody is asking you and say, well, I'm kind of you know, running late, you know, can you just let me take a look at your homework assignment so I can just copy it? Don't do that, okay? Because if I find out you, know, you, the person who actually originates the material, will also get a zero, okay? So don't do that. There are other ways to help your fellow classmates, and I'll kind of talk about it a little bit later. Activities involving academic dishonesty do not count for attendance, which means you know if we have an exam scheduled and there's dishonesty involved, then it is counted as an absent. Um, I may ask um, people that I think is kind of questionable to do some additional work or explain work that is already submitted in order to determine whether you know it is copied or not. Okay, so I might ask people to kind of tell me, well, tell me why you do it like this here, okay? Or tell me why you think your program is not working. Or tell me what you think, you know, what do you think this program is going to do if I give it this type of input? So I can do, I can you know, basically ask questions like that. Now in this class, all work, you know, that includes assignments, quizzes, and exams are expected to be independent and original. Independent means it, it is without the aid of someone else. Original means it is not being copied or derived from the work of somebody else. Okay? They're related, but not exactly the same thing. And then the last point basically said, you know, if I you know, find out you know, somebody has been copying uh, with a particular homework assignment, that's basically just a red flag. And I might go back to previous you know, submissions and look for you know signs of you know academic dishonesty as well. Uh, grading scenario: What happens when the submission of more than one students are identical or nearly identical? The, the answer to the question is it depends on whether it is likely or not. Okay. Programming is not exactly the same thing as English writing. Okay. In an English writing class, if two students submit exactly the same article or the same paper, it's extremely unlikely. In a programming class, depending on the homework assignment, occasionally, you know, there's only like one or two ways to do something. And this is a class of 40 students, okay? It is likely that, you know, I, was t I can see two submissions that are identical or nearly identical. That's okay, not a problem. But depending on the complexity of the homework assignment, for more complex homework assignments, it is unlikely that two people would turn in exactly the same code. So in those cases, I would look at those as, mm, maybe that's not independent. Um, questions in exams, basically the same thing, okay? You know, in certain cases, 
if it's a multiple choice test, especially a true false test, you know, <laughs> it is very likely that half the class would give me the same answer. At least half the class would give me the same answer. Hopefully okay. All of them give the same answer. Sorry. Hopefully, all of them should give you the right answer. The right answer. Yeah. yeah. Well, that means I didn't, you know, I didn't make the question tricky enough. Note to self. <laughs> all right. So that's that part. And now we are moving on to the grading part. Uh, the first part is, you know, what people like to see. Um, basically, this is how I assign letter grades based on the percentage of all the possible points that people would get at the end of the semester. So what this means is anyone with less than 12.5% of all the point values will get an F. Okay? Anyone with 12.5% to 37.5% would get a D, and so on. To get an A in this class, it means you have to get 87.5% or more of all the available points to get an A in this class. Are there any questions about the mapping from percentage to letter grades? Questions? All right, moving on. So when we break down the uh, proportions, we have 20% coming from homework assignments. So these are these tend to be smaller homework assignments. You know they can be done in a week, usually. Um, the final exam is forty percent. Um, in this class, I'm considering using a project instead of an exam for exam one and exam two. I have not decided yet, but each one of those will worth you know twenty percent of your final grade. Moving on, grading FAQ. Um, the score is assigned based on observable academic competence and not effort. Okay, so this part has nothing to do with you know cheating, copying from somebody else. Um, I put this here because um, in my earlier years, I have had a student who come to me and say, "Tag, I'm not really happy with this grade that I'm getting. What are you getting? I'm getting a B. No, well, that's not too bad of a grade. But Tag, you know what? I spent a lot of time studying for this class. I think I should deserve an A. Well, but you're not, your, 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 your score is, you know, a B, so I can only give you a B. I understand that you might be putting a lot of effort into this class. So it's based on what I can observe and not, you know, effort. Okay, so you gotta, you know, Make sure you know all your effort. You know is basically made observable in the tests and the homework assignments in this test. I'm not going to ask too many multiple choice questions or none at all for a class like this. So you know, don't worry about this point. Um, I use rubrics for the most part for grading purposes. In other words, you know for each item, I would basically say, okay, do I see? What do I see? Okay, is this answer 100% correct? Yes. Okay, or is this mostly correct? I can see the student understand the concept, but might have made a, you know, silly mistake. Okay, careless mistake. Okay, um, or is the student not really understanding the concept? Maybe a part of the concept, but not entirely. Or the student did not turn in anything at all for this part. So I'm going to use a rubric, you know, for you know grading, you know, in these tests. In this class, there are no late submission except for. Um, excused absences okay if you are sick and you have a doctor's note i will give you extra time for your homework assignments okay. all right so moving on to tips how to help out a fellow student this one is kind of okay it's kind of longish i'm not going to read the boring part so i'm going to just do this part here you know a sample conversation between two students Student A, my program isn't working. I'm stuck. Can I take a look at yours? Okay. How many people have been asked this question before in your other classes? May not be a programming class. Okay. Some of you. Okay. So the student B, which is doing the right thing, is saying, "I'm afraid I cannot show you my answer. However, I will be. I'd be glad to answer questions regarding the concepts involved in the assignment." Okay. Um, well, the other way to end this conversation right here is student B saying, "No, go away." <laughs> okay. So I'm assuming student B 
wants to help out you know student A. And sometimes you know, helping a fellow student can help you get a better understanding of the material because you know your brain exercises more when you try to explain a concept to somebody else. Okay. So assuming student B wants to help student A, you know, this is what student B should do is not to disclose the answer to student A, but to say, well, I can help explain the concept involved. And then student A basically says, can I show you the program so you can give me some pointers? Tell me how to fix this program, what's wrong with it? And student B would say, I'd rather not take a look at your program. Can you describe the issue without showing me the code? Okay. Instead of having student A, you know, the student who's stuck, dumping the program on student B and say, okay, here's my program, fix it. Okay, student B is asking student A, don't give me your code, don't show it to me, but describe what's wrong with your program. Okay, are there any questions about this step? Why do you think, you know, student B is doing the right thing here? Instead of looking at the program and tell student A, oh, you know what, you know, this, pro this variable needs to be incremented here, student B is saying, well, tell me what's wrong with the program. Can you describe the symptom? Why do you think that's helpful to student A? Helps them learn rather than just showing them the answer. Mm -hmm. Yep, go ahead. It would make them think the whole process through and so they could look at it, you know, when they're trying to think about what they wanted to do and they'll go through what they've written and maybe see, oh, I missed a step here or it's exactly. not what they screwed up. Exactly, so you're both right, okay? You know, the way that student B is doing here is trying to get student A to learn the skills required to become a good developer, to become a good programmer. And student A, you know, who originally asked, can I see your code, is complaining and saying, you know, well, that's difficult, you know, where do I start? You know, the program is just not working, okay? You know, being frustrated and sometimes I can understand that. Um, the student B would kind of follow up with a different question. It's like, well, okay, tell me what you expect the program to do and what do you think it actually is actually doing instead. Okay, so compare the expected behavior with the actual behavior. What is the difference? Where is it starting to have a difference between you know what it's supposed to do as opposed to what it's actually doing? Well, student A, you know, probably this okay, that this is not exactly sequential because you know between this step and the previous one, that might be a few minutes. Okay, so student A would basically go through the program and say, well, this loop is supposed to exit after going through it four times, but it's not getting out at all. It becomes an infinite loop. So what's what's going on with my program? Student B can ask, you know, what is the condition of the loop? Well, the condition of the loop is x equals four. Okay, student B is going to say, okay, I see, what is the meaning of a single equal symbol in C++? I know this is not a C++ program in class, I'm just using it as an example. Okay, okay. so this is where you know, the fun begins, because the student A will come back and say, well, a single equal symbol in C++ is comparing for equality. For those of you who know C++, you know that is not the right answer. So this is the problem, okay? So student B is using a step-by-step -step method to help student A understand what, what the problem is with his program or her program, and in the next step, how to fix it. Okay, student B would say, well, that's not true, okay? You know, a single equal symbol is not comparing for equality. Student A asks, so what does it mean, okay? See, student A is always trying to get an answer, okay? You know, it's trying to shortcut the whole process. Just give me what I need to fix the program so I can turn it in and get a good grade, okay? And student B is trying to help student A understand the class material, okay? So it will be, still be useful after, you know, taking this class. So student B comes back, you know, and politely say, Tech covered that in class a week ago, you should review your notes or watch the lecture recording again. Okay? And this is where things really usually come you know, become kind of nasty because student A, you know, being, you know, not getting a straight answer for all the previous steps is probably getting pretty frustrated and say, come on, just tell me, I don't have time to review my notes. And student B is encouraging, which is be which is much better than I am. I won't, it won't take long, plus it's really beneficial to you if you review the notes. 
Student A says, oh wait, all right, Grumpy. After a few minutes, I see a single equal symbol is an assignment operator. Student B confirms that and say, so what is a equality comparison symbol? Oh, I get it. Double equal symbol means checking for equality. Student B you know, confirms that as well and say, yep, that's right. You know, so how do you, do you know how to fix the program now? Da 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 da, and you know, so. So I know the technical part is about C++ and not really related to this class, but does everybody understand the essence of this you know, little conversation? Okay, and do you think this applies only to this class? Exactly, it applies to all of your other classes. Okay. Uh, study habit, you know, I think you know by this time I don't really need to say it, but you know, it's always helpful to you know study a little bit before the class, except for the first class, obviously. Um, and also bring something you know to take notes. Okay, I don't care how you do it. You have the computer in front of you. You can start a Google document if you want to. Okay, just take notes. Okay, now when you take notes, try to write down something that I'm not saying. Okay, because I'm doing screen recording, including the audio and everything that I do on screen. Okay, so there's really no need to frantically try to copy everything that I do on the screen. Instead, what you should be focusing on would be things that I'm not really saying, it is your understanding, okay? You're suddenly getting an idea going, oh, so, blah, 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 blah. Write that down, because the screen recording is not recording what you're going through in your mind when you're listening to me, okay? So that is more important than stuff that I'm doing on screen. You have to focus on the stuff that I'm doing on screen and understand it, but what you should be writing down will be in your own words how things work. Okay, things that you think is important. Oh, okay, so that's important, but tech is not exactly mentioning it. I should write it down. Okay. Um, since I'm doing screen recording, uh, you might also want to record like a timestamp. Like right now is 9.37 and tech is talking about blah, blah, blah. Okay, just jot down you know, a little timestamp on your own notes. So next time, you know, when you need to review the material on YouTube, you can you know, basically just fast forward to that one, you know, to that spot, and you don't have to watch the entire thing all over again just to say, oh, so what did Tech say about you know infinite loops? Okay, well he mentioned the infinite loops about uh, uh, 38 minutes into the lecture. Just skip all the way to that part so you don't have to watch the entire thing again. Um, after a lecture, you know, you want to basically study, you know, again, you know, go through your own notes and see what is important, what concepts are covered in that particular lecture. Um, it helps to reinforce the concepts, you know, because right after the lecture, you still remember most of the stuff at that time. When, uh, when you have homework assignments, try to start on the homework assignments as soon as possible. Because starting on homework assignments as soon as possible doesn't increase the amount of work, does it? Well, if anything, it might decrease it a little bit. And after an assignment is due, I always give you a solution. Okay, if I have a homework assignment, let's say the homework assignment is due today, I always make the homework, assi homework assignment due before the class. So during the class, I'll be going over the solution. Okay, so what you want to do is to compare your solution to mine. In programming, there are usually more than one ways to do the same thing. But you might want to compare and say, well, let's look at you know, how TAC is doing it and how I'm doing it and make sure that you understand whether the two programs do exactly the same thing and if they do not, try to understand how they're different. And I tend to use a lot of examples in class that are not in my notes and that's why I do the screen recording because it captures everything that I do in class. So you, want, you might want to use those you know, to, you know, for studying purposes. Now in this class, it's particularly important to do the screen recording because in this class, I'm not doing text programming. I'm doing drag and drop graphical type of programming, which is really hard for people to take notes of because you, you have to draw the pictures, right? The blocks and stuff like that. So when I insert a new block of code into a, you know, a bigger block, you know, how do you take notes you know, to represent that? That's pretty difficult, okay? <clears throat> 
right, so we are almost done here. And this is the tentative schedule of the topics for this class. You know, you know, it's a it's a guideline, it's a reminder for, of, for myself, you know, what to talk about, but the exact dates, you know, maybe it's different from what you see here. All right. Are there any questions about the syllabus? Yeah, I got a question. Yep, go ahead. Um, it says twenty fifth and then first. Um, is Wednesday off? That is that's because of mobile that, that particular topic takes two lectures. That's why. So it's basically it's, we start that topic on the 25th, but it will not. Yeah, the next topic is going to start on the 1st because it might take me two lectures to go over this. So today and Wednesday. Sorry? So today and Wednesday. Today and Wednesday, right. But that's tentative again. You know, so we, it might take less time or more time. All right, so with this out of the way, we are starting to have people standing in the back, only one person. Let's see, do we have any empty seats here? No, we don't. So we have two students who do not have, three students do not have four who do not have access to a computer. Okay, so we're done with um, the syllabus. So what you want to do is to um, uh, take this quiz, okay? You know, when you see this symbol with a piece of paper with a check sign on it, it is quote unquote a quiz, okay? Except this one is not exactly a quiz. What it is is asking you a series of questions. And the answer is usually either I acknowledge that this part, this topic or this you know, statement is covered in the syllabus, or you can say, no, I do not acknowledge that I want to be dropped from this class. Okay, so you have choices, quote unquote, choices. Okay, here's the, your, your actual homework assignment. So these two activities, you have to do it as soon as possible. The co-requisite co check is something that you have to do. Everybody needs to do this, okay? Because there's no way for me to check automatically for co-requisites. I can check prerequisites, but I cannot check co-requisites using the tool of this campus. CISP 362 has a co-requisite. That means you, have, you must be, have taken one or more of the following classes, or you are currently taking one or more of the following classes. The three classes that qualifies is CISP 300, which is Introduction to Programming, or Problem Solving and Algorithm Design, uh, CISP 301, which is um, the equivalent class, but it's only offered by Sac City, or CISP 370, which is Visual Basic. So you have to be either taking one of those classes right now, or have taken one of those classes already, okay? because it's a co-requisite for this class. Okay? Now, some of you may say, but I have extensive programming background and da-da-da-da. That's okay, okay? That counts too. But you cannot just tell me that you have to... That's an interesting one. I'm thinking the, the prerequisite challenge form will cover that as well. So you want to go to the uh, division office, which is uh, room 133, and ask for a prerequisite challenge form and then you can basically just list you know, all the stuff that you have done that demonstrates that you have some understanding of programming already. Okay. Basically to fulfill the co-requisite requirement of this class. So what you can do is to submit a PDF or a screenshot, okay, but PDF is better, um, that shows that you are currently enrolled in one of these classes, or if you have you know, taken these classes already, um, you can you know, uh, do a, a printout of a an official transcript. You know something that shows your grade for one of these classes that you have taken already. Okay. Are there any questions about this part? Questions. Okay. Now, for some of you, if you have taken classes from me, you know before, you can kind of you know just you know, say, you know, well, you know, I took one of your you know CISP classes, and you know I can kind of do that check. But I would much rather have you guys to just to you know print it out, turn it in, you know, and it's just easier that way for me. 
So for you, if you want to add a submission, what you want to do is to click here. And what it does is allow you to upload a file. So I would suggest uploading a PDF file. Or if you don't know how to print to a PDF file, you can do a screenshot. Okay, capture that to a bitmap file and then upload it here. Are there any questions about this step? Questions? Okay, let me just kind of finish this part to, just to show you how exactly to upload a file. So let's just say that I'm looking at my transcript. I don't really have a transcript. So I'm just use a random screen and say, okay, that's my transcript, okay? And I'm using Linux right now. It has a screenshot tool. So I go to accessories, go to screenshot. I can select a region. So let's just say that this part here, you know, shows that I've currently enrolled in CISB 300, okay? Which is obviously not the case. <clears throat> I click save, save to a particular file, and just say uh, proof of CISB 300. I'm saving as a PNG file. You can save it as a JPEG or a GIF file, doesn't matter. Format, go back to the homework assignment. And now I can click this part here and click upload a file. Go to the location where I saved that file. Press the enter key. Click upload this file. And if you cannot follow the steps, you know, don't worry, it's all getting recorded. So I will show you how to find my screen recordings next. Okay, so this file is uploaded. We are not done yet, okay? There's one more click which is save changes. If you do not click save changes, it's not really submitted. So remember to click save changes, and that should bring you back to the assignment screen, and you should also see a link to the file that you have turned in. You're done now, okay? Unless you want to turn it in again or turn in a different copy, then you're all done, okay? I'm not gonna grade it until Wednesday, so you have two days to finish this. How long do you think it will take you to finish this? I think some people are done already. It might be yeah. they have turned in something already. Okay. All right. <clears throat> so you got you know, two hours, to, excuse me, two days and 14 hours to finish this part. Just don't forget to do it. Okay. It is important. It's due on Thursday, the 28th. So you have some time to do it. <clears throat> Are there any questions about this step? Okay, if there are no questions, I'm expecting, I'm looking forward to see your submission by Thursday. So with this out of the way, I'm going to continue with my class, except I cannot. If you look at all the topics of this class, it says right here, what you will need to move on is, um, you require score in a missing activity. Oh no, that's bad. Because it's, <laughs> okay, I will have to fix that. Um, but since I do have you know this screen here, I logged in as the instructor, so I'm, I can actually do this part here. Okay. Okay, let me fix that first because you will need that. <laughs> okay, what I, the problem has to do with um, the activity, the restriction is gone already. I, I changed the activity, so now it has to be you know, adjusted accordingly. Okay, so now this is refreshed. Okay, I'm using Firefox as professor and using Chrome as student. So as a student, I can refresh my screen now. As what you will see is you need to achieve a required score in syllabus acknowledgement. So I'm gonna have to go through this myself first it's a good way to do it. At least I can show you what a quiz looks like. Okay, so I can attend the quiz now. And it has seven questions. The first question is, all instructors are required to provide students access to or have a distribute a copy of the class syllabus. You are not going to get a printed syllabus because I know 80% of the students will just lose it right after the class. So instead, it is kept online, okay? You can go to Moodle and you can read the syllabus anytime online, or you can download it, print it out, do whatever you think you, know, you want to do 
but it's not going to be you know, distributed on paper for this class. However, this, instruct this instructor obligation only applies to enrolled students who attend the first class, meaning all of you here. In all other classes, each student is responsible to ask for access, or in all other cases, sorry, each student is responsible to ask for access to or have a copy of the class syllabus. So you have two choices. One, I do not have access to the syllabus, or two, I have access to or a copy of the syllabus. So I click B, move on to the next, next question. This one is kind of interesting. It copies academic, academic uh, integrity slash honesty, um, and I am having a link to Princeton University's own copy of these you know, policy. It's, re it's a really well-written document, so I strongly suggest you guys to kind of take a look and see how an Ivy League university um, treat this particular subject matter. So you can kind of read through this here. Well, since I wrote this, I have read through that already. So I can just go to here and say, either I do not understand or acknowledge the importance and meaning of academic integrity slash honesty, or B, I acknowledge the importance and the meaning of, acad of academic integrity slash honesty. Next. Okay, so I'm just gonna kind of fast forward through this. By the way, you cannot just copy the A's and B's because it's, it's, it gets scrambled. <laughs> you never know, someone may want to copy it. Okay, so I'm almost done. Now if you accidentally answer incorrectly and get a less than 100% you know, score of this test, don't worry, okay? You can take this test again, and again, and again. There's no limit of how many times you have to, you can take it. It's just that, you know, no activity will be opened up until you have a 100% score with this cortical quiz, okay? All right, so I'm all done here. I say submit all and finish, which means I'm ready for grading. And I got a score. I got 100%. How do I know whether I get 100% or not? You can check your own score if you go to the gray sheet. And with the gray sheet, Was a check. I'm not seeing this item. But there's one more thing I can check is whether the other topics have opened up. And you can see that this part here, what what you will need as a topic is no longer hidden. You can see all the links now. Okay, so that means you know I did actually achieve a hundred percent score in the syllabus acknowledgement activity. Okay, All right. So what we're going to do is actually get started with you know what we're going to do in this class. We are not going to use Java for this particular class. I know most of you already know you know to program Android devices you're supposed to use Java and use Eclipse and stuff like that. We can do that in CISP 363, the next class. But for this class, I'm going to start a little bit easier so that people can really kind of jump into app programming right away without having to understand the syntax and all kinds of stuff like that. What we'll do is we'll use MIT App Inventor. Okay, so let's go to that website for now. Um, if you just want to get right away to the website, it's just App Inventor. A P P I N V E N T O R dot M I T dot E D U. Yeah, A I two is you know we go straight to the actual engine, but this is the entry page. This is the main page for uh, App Inventor at MIT. App Inventor was originally a Google uh, project, but since Google decided eh, it's too wasting too much of our resources. Uh, Google decided to give up the project, basically stop development. MIT decided to pick it up and continue the development of App Inventor, 
So now it is an MIT project and not a Google project anymore. Okay. So once you get here, you will see all kinds of you know, links. You can you know, click get started here and follow the steps. You can go through the tutorial. Um, you can actually you know, go to teach here. Uh, basically, these are the material that MIT thought would be useful for teaching a class using App Inventor. Um, you can also go to a forum. Okay, you know, basically that's a way to kind of interact with other people to you know find out more about app programming using App Inventor. Right. So what we'll do is we'll go to get started. So if you want to get started, there are you know, it's not really as straightforward as. I would like it to be, but since the interface allows you to interact with an Android device directly or an emulator directly, that's why there, there's a little bit of extra steps that you have to go through to set it up. Okay, So basically the bottom line is you need um, App Inventor Setup, you know, that's the name of the program that you have to install in order to use certain features of App Inventor. You can start programming right away without having to install anything, but how do you test your program? Right? Because these programs are supposed to run in on an Android device. Okay? So if you are just going through the web interface to do the programming, how do you run the program? How do you check whether your program is working or not? So this is why you need to install a program in Windows or Mac OS X or Linux before you can actually test your program. You can write a program right away, but to test your program, unless you use your own mobile device uh, for testing and using the you can use a Wi-Fi network, um, you will have to install the application. Okay. How many people are planning to use your own Android device for testing and debugging? So we have a few people with an Android device, and I can show you guys how to do that. That's you know, one of the easier things to do. But I do need to find my Wi-Fi router. You know, otherwise it won't work. That particular method is not going to work. Okay. So the setup instruction is here, <clears throat> and they give you three options. The first option is, which is recommended, is to use is to build the app with Android device and Wi-Fi connection. Now, the problem with that approach in this classroom has to do with your lap, your desktop computers are on a wired network. So if your mobile device is on a wireless network, it doesn't work because they're not in the same subnet. Okay, We have had that problem before you know, from past semesters. But since this is a lecture part of the class, if you do this at home and your laptop computer or desktop computer and your Android device are on the same subnet, there's no problem. Okay. It's pretty easy, you know. I can show you how you know, what it looks like, but I cannot really demonstrate it here. For those of you who do not have an Android device or you do you don't want to test your program on your own Android device, you can use an emulator, okay? Or you can connect to your Android device using a USB cable, and that will work in this classroom as well. But in both cases, you will have to install a separate program on your PC first. So I'm going to click the instruction here. I'm not going to go through, you know, I'm not going to read all through, you know, through all this stuff here, but I do want to show you one thing here. It has instructions for Mac OS X, it has instructions for Windows, and then the instructions for Linux is coming soon. And guess how soon that soon has been? <laughs> for the past year or so. <laughs> okay. And you know, I'm not exactly a patient man when it comes to waiting a year for something that is supposed to be coming soon. So when you go to this class here, you will see, um, OK, I have gone through the entire process and captured it on YouTube already. So if you're going to set this up using a Windows machine, just click that link, and it will show you your know, step-by-step how to do it. Okay. In fact, let's go ahead and do it. So I'm just going to click this, open a new tab. It's on YouTube. I'm going to pause here and turn on the speaker for this classroom. Absolutely right. I did not say a single thing. Okay, 
This is my response to the requirement that I'm supposed to close caption everything because there might be a student who require closed captioning. So what you want to do is to turn on closed captioning. And I know some of you have no faith in close, the automated closed captioning of uh, YouTube. That's OK. Just, just watch. And you can see the closed captioning is 100% correct, even has the double quotes in it. How can that happen? I actually typed the closed captioning. <laughs> it was not you know, automatically converted by me saying something and Google converting it. I actually typed in the closed captioning. Okay, so this will get, get you through the whole process, you know, step by step with instructions and a screen capture of how to do this. And the good thing is, for those of you who do not find my uh, choice of music agreeable, just turn off, you know, turn down the volume and read the closed captioning. <laughs> Are there any questions about, you know, how to watch YouTube to kind of get through this process? No questions? Okay, very good. All right, so getting back to here. Oh, let me show you one other thing first, okay? How do you find my your uh, screen, uh, lecture recording when you get out of this classroom. Go to YouTube, and there's one thing you need to write down somewhere. Okay, you can use it. Send an email to yourself or something. Okay, so you go to YouTube, and if you just type slash some profs, that should get to my channel directly. Okay, because that's my the name of my channel is some profs. Long history, you know. I'm not going to explain why. Um, and then under videos, if you click on videos here, it will list all the videos recorded, but in a reverse time order. Okay, so the most recent one will be listed first, and then the oldest one will be kind of like all the way down. Okay, that's how you can find your know, screen recording for this class. The title of each screen recording is always, at least with me, starting with the date. Okay. So 2014-08-05, which is one screen right now, that means it, it was recorded in, on August 5th. Okay? So this is how you can locate a lecture of a particular day, and then you can just watch it. I mean, these are you know, basically um, full lecture recording, 80 minutes usually. Um, you can just go through the whole thing. For those of you who know how to download using Flash God or some other tool, you can download the the video recording on your own device so you can watch it without network access um, so it's up to you any questions about this part just write down some props okay that's the name of the YouTube channel sorry link for the link in Google. Uh, I can do that all right so what are the other links then okay the first one is my modded AI setup 2.2 for portable installation in other words, you can install it at home, you can install it at the computer at work, but if you want to work on your homework assignment in, let's say, the library or some other computers that do not have this tool installed and they don't give you administrative right to install it, what are you going to do? Okay, well, that's the answer. Okay, the portable version of AI Inventor allows you to set it up, uh, you can install it on a thumb drive, and then you can just run it from the thumb drive. So it gives you the flexibility of doing it on just about any computer they can plug a thumb drive into. Okay. So if you click on this link here, it will give you a link to my um, Google Drive because it's a little bit too big. I don't want to put it onto the Moodle server. And you can just download it. Okay, so click it. Oops. No, 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 no. Don't click it. If you click it, it shows you what's in it. So you want to just download it the whole thing. Yeah, if you accidentally click it, you just hit the download button anyway, it's fine. Yep, so you just download it here. And it's it's kind of big, it's 93 megabytes. It's not huge, but it is 93 megabytes, it's a zip file. Once you download the zip file in Windows, just click it, open it, unzip the content onto your thumb drive. That's it. That's all you need to do. 
Okay, there's an executable you know that you have to click to start the whole thing, and that's it. There's not not much to it. All right, so that's one option. Um, if you are like me and you use Linux, then you have been waiting for a long time. <laughs> um, I actually went ahead and looked at the PC setup and I just made a distribution and make it work in Linux. So if you use a Debian, a Debian based installation of Linux, you can use AI setup for Linux 2.2. I have checked it personally and it works. Okay. In fact, since this computer or this um, live CD doesn't have it installed, I'm gonna do it now. So I'll just go ahead and download it. And it's a DIB, DEB file. Okay, so in Linux we have to we have to keep this. It's a little bit bigger because it has some other tools. And I didn't really clean up the whole thing. All right, and here's a YouTube to use the portable setup. So if you want to install it on a thumb drive, you know, for Windows purposes. You can watch this particular setup guide. Um, basically, step by step, it will show you how to do, how to do it. Okay. But I am going to show you how to do it in Linux for those of you who are going to use Linux. All right, so I have this file downloaded. Of course, I forgot where it's downloaded to. So let's go ahead and say open show in folder. That's what I need. It's under my downloads folder. So let's go there. If you're into Linux, you know this should not really you know bother you much. So I use the pkg i AI setup Linux. Oh. No. By the way, how many people are using Linux? And it will say it's version 2.0, but it's actually 2.2, so. And it's installing it over 1.1, because I had 1.1 installed originally. All right, now it's installed. And for, for Linux, you have to start it manually. So you have to set, uh, you have to basically type AI starter on the command line. And when it starts, that's always going to say, okay, which is, that's what that's what you will see also uh, for the Windows version. Okay, if you double click on the batch file or the executable, this is all it's going to show is it is hit Control C to quit. That's all it's going to show. All right, so let's switch back to the browser and see whether it works or not. Okay, so how do we know whether it works or not? Okay, you want to go to the uh, App Inventor website. If you want to go straight to the tool itself instead of you know all the you know uh, the entry screen. You can use ai2.appinventor.mit.edu and that will get you straight to the programming tool itself without having to go through the tutorial and you know, all the other options. Okay. And the first thing it will ask you is which Google account do you want to use to be associated with this cloud-based tool? Okay, because it is linked to uh, uh, your Google accounts. If you have multiple accounts like me, you can you know select one of these you know, accounts here, or can sign in to another account if you want to. Okay, because most of you probably have multiple accounts. So I'm going to use uh, my school account here. So if you want to use your apps.lostreels.edu account for because it, it it is homework related, you can go ahead and use that one. Click allow, and since I haven't signed in yet, it's asking me to sign in. Oh, click the wrong one. I did not want to change my password. All right, here we go. And then we have to go to that screen again, the AI2. Go back to here, click allow. So 
after a few you know pop-up screens we are finally here this is the tool that we'll be using for this entire semester to write your Android app okay um, it's surprisingly easy to use so I'm gonna do one little thing here just to show you guys you know like you know, how do we put something together what am I gonna see what does the tool look like so what we'll do is we'll click new project and I'm just gonna, gonna call my project you know simple okay that's all it's gonna do and that will get you to immediately into what we call the designer view okay it's called the designer view you can kind of see it here you know but because the the tool wants to be wider than I can fit on this screen it doesn't show up you know really well like that um, the normal zoom control like control minus still works here okay but it does make it harder to read so I'm gonna use you know, the default here this is called a designer view uh, what you can do here is to design the layout of the app that you're gonna develop okay and the way you do it is drag and drop okay if you want to have a text box just go here and drag it into here if you want a label which is a static vertical static you know text that you can show on your app just drag it here and put it here okay so I'm gonna just do something simple here and change you know text for label one to um, this is a simple test and if you want to have a button go ahead and drag a button from user interface into the viewer okay so the viewer for the most part is a what you see is what you get visit wake kind of screen that let you see what your app is going to look like on a smaller device okay are there any questions about any of the steps that we have done so far questions okay and right now there's no code associated with this program whatsoever okay um, I know it's a little bit ahead of time but I do want to show you how you can attach code to your program because otherwise this is kind of boring right I mean, just putting stuff on the screen but you cannot do a single thing about it so let me just kind of show you and we will get into this in more depth later on if you want to put in some code some logic some action into your application you switch to the blocks view okay so click blocks here and let's just say that I want to change the label the text on label one when I click that button okay doesn't seem very difficult there's no conditions whatsoever so what I do is I go to my blocks pane here go to button one click button one here and you can see all of the things that button one can trigger so I will pick click here and put it into the blocks viewer here that's how you program is drag and drop and let's just say that when button one is clicked I want to do something about the text in label one so I go back to label one here and it gives me these options these are the things that label one can either provide or can do in this case I want to change the text of label one so I'm gonna say set label one text to something and that something I want to set it to is text so I wouldn't go to text here and you can do all kinds of fancy stuff with text except in this case I don't want to do anything too fancy I just want to change the text to um, this concludes the test okay that's all and that's my entire program what where's the what is the syntax of this programming interface well there is syntax quote unquote syntax there are rules to this programming interface but it's easy because if it doesn't fit it doesn't click <laughs> okay you cannot write some code you know that has syntax syntax error and it comes back and complains about it okay it because if it doesn't fit it just won't click okay so this program does work at this point so now how do I test my program well this is not gonna work because you guys cannot see my screen from that far away so what I'll do is I'm going to start an emulator okay go to connect and click emulator and it will say this might take a minute or two except I do have a faster PC here it doesn't really take that long so right now I have an emulated Android device it's not a real device it is a pretend device um, 
But the nice part of this is I don't need a real device for testing my programs. And it's starting up. It's a really old version of Android, but for the purposes of this class, it's going to be OK. So this is a virtual device. It's not real, OK? It is just a, a virtual machine. I love that. It's charging. Yeah, it's charging. <laughs> like a bull. <laughs> No, I don't have to do a single thing. It, it will do everything automatically. So it's going to start AI Companion or App Inventor Companion in the emulator automatically. Um, the text that you see in the background, you know, this portion here, kind of tells you what it's trying to do and you know which step you're in at this point. So it's going to wait eight seconds to make sure everything is good. supposed to update um, App Inventor Companion on this side, except it's not doing it. All right, that's not what I saw when I tested this at home. <laughs> so I'm going to get this fixed, <laughs> because it's supposed to pop up a box and say, you know, do you, I want to update you know, App Inventor Companion inside the emulator, but it's not really showing that. Um, we are kind of running out of time, too, so this is saved by the bell. Um, if you do this on a PC, you don't have to kind of go through this trouble because you know the tool is designed for you know PC using uh, Windows and also Mac OS 10. I'm going to fix it and you know get it to work you know, in on Wednesday for Linux machines. All right? Um, obviously I forgot to take roll, uh, but for those of you who are here uh, go ahead and log in, you know, sign in to the Moodle account, and I'll use that for role purposes. Okay. Um, if you come in late, uh, that's the password that you will need to kind of add to the class if you're not already enrolled. If you're already enrolled, you know, just go into Moodle sometime today, and I'll count it in as being present, just for this time, because I forgot to bring the role sheet. Any questions? Questions? All right. So I look forward to seeing all of you on Wednesday. Okay. And this would not be a bad time to start thinking about what you want to do with App Inventor. If you already know something about programming, you can kind of think about doing some programming that involves you know logic and actions and steps like that. If you have never taken a programming class before and you're taking CISP 300 at the same time. You can kind of think about simpler, you know, projects, you know, things that you might want to do with an app application, um, because I'm going to use that as a project for this class. All right. Any other questions? Any questions. All right. I'll see you guys on Wednesday. Yes. Sorry. Okay. Hold on a second.